Well, we keep everything pretty anonymous. At least we try to. Okay. Um, so, just for internet purposes, you know, people, you know, getting their information on the internet. But, um, welcome again to another uh, Bother the Father. Um, tonight, also, I have uh, Zoom going. The link is in the description if you'd like to join us um, through a virtual connection, virtual meeting. You're more than welcome to do that. We're also recording it offline just to make sure in case, you know, something happens with the feed. So, uh, we'll also take your, your questions on Facebook if you have them. Uh, we have a couple people here tonight uh, in person, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, any any questions. Okay, this one's kind of out there, but it's it's kind of sarcastic, but it gets to where I want to go. Okay. Okay. Say there's two people, and one person just hates everybody. He's just an evil person and he decides to blow up a church and kill everybody in it and it's first communion and he's going to get all these kids and really he's not repentant he's not nothing and he does it he's happy he walks out and gets hit by a bus mm. now he goes to hell because he's unrepentant and he's going to hell okay that's the theory okay another guy wakes up it's sunday should go to church but he wants to go bowling. Mm -hmm. So he goes bowling instead. Mm -hmm. That's more sin, he goes mm -hmm. to hell. And the bus hits him too, <laughs> same bus. Um, is there like different degrees of heat in hell? Or how does it, <laughs> yeah. how, how well, do they? Huh. I mean, so uh, yeah, I mean, you're kind of thinking about like a Dante type inferno scenario, right? You ever read Dante? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you have these like nine okay. levels of hell. They kind of correspond to the different uh, vices, right? With the center being um, Satan himself. And what Dante portrays hell, and again, this is a, fic a work of fiction. It's kind of an act of, you know, uh, just thought provoking, but not necessarily anything theologically uh, sound in it. But at the center of hell, he posits that, that Satan actually is not, it's not a flake of fire. It's actually freezing cold, right? There's like no warmth at all. Right, which, and if we think about it, we talk about uh, what hell is. Um, it's the absence of God, right, or at least the farthest way to get from God, right. Which, so that's why Dante kind of posits maybe cold because God is warmth, God is you know joy, God is peace. Um, okay, but as far as like, is there like a different level of hell than someone who willfully doesn't go to mass compared to someone who murders many people? Um, well, the answer is we don't, we don't know. Hell is just hell. It's, regardless, it's the absence of God, or at least the farthest away from God you can possibly be. Now, we may want to say, well, you know, also God's mercy always endures. So we, regardless of when they're getting hit the bus, we would trust there's a moment, or at least an opportunity for those people to repent. And that's all to be necessary for their salvation, right? That perhaps at the moment of death, there's this, oh man, I really shouldn't have done that, boom. That's all God really needs. Now, they may be in purgatory for a very long time, okay. right? We would never want to say, and that's one of the beauties of the church, the church never <laughs> condemns anybody to hell. We never posit anyone is in hell. Now, we won't go as far as saying that there is nobody in hell because we just don't know, right? We hope there's not. But rationally speaking, it would make sense there may be some, right? Maybe many. We just don't know. But we also believe that God will give his grace and give his mercy and give every opportunity to actually shed that upon somebody. But it has to be received. And so at the moment of death, we would hope that someone would give a last opportunity to repent and say, I'm sorry for what I did, Lord, because they offended you. Right? My love for you. And that would be all that would be necessary for their salvation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so as far as like if they both go to hell, is there, no, they're both going to hell, right? They're both mortal sins, right? The, the, you know, there's no, let's say like a, uh, we may say like, you know, rationally speaking, well, one seems a lot worse than the other. Well, okay. But regardless, there's a willful act against God's love, right? A willful rejection of that grace. And that's really what mortal sin is. So if the first guy was mentally ill... That would be taken into consideration, right? Yeah, because so so yeah, the 
the whole issue of mortal sin, right, would be that there's something that's bad. I know it's bad, fully know it's bad, and then I do it anyway. So somebody who's suffering from mental illness, they wouldn't necessarily have that faculty to actually make that determination. And if there's no determination, then there's no moral sin. Right? So God would take that consideration, of course, right? God, I, I, I like to tell people in the professional, I said this also too, like, God doesn't condemn that technicality, right? It's not like, you know, oh, well, you know, shoot, I had, uh, I had work and I had, my kids were screaming and, you know, I just lost track of time and, oh, I just, I didn't go, I didn't go to Mass on Sunday, right? Well, it's not like, well, you know, on uh, November 21st of 2021, um, you could have gone to Mass uh, and you didn't, so therefore you're going to hell. God does not break that way. Because right. that happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so, so that's the thing, right? We also would be cognizant objectively of what, what, what our obligation is, but the circumstances do reduce the culpability, right? Yeah, my, the clock was off, so... I was going to be late, so I just ran upstairs and turned on the television yeah. and I streamed it. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, right, right. So, I mean, we also have to give these things consideration, and God does too, right? God knows the content of our heart and our real intentions, right? I can't tell you what the intention of that mass murder is or what the person that going to mass would be. I can't, which, can, which means I can't tell you if it's mortal sin or not. If someone comes to a confessional and starts confessing, I'm assuming everything that person tells me is mortal sin because... I don't know, right? Only a person knows in God. Um, but we also know that we trust that God is going to give every opportunity for repentance, even at the moment of death. As, as soon as that, that bus is in that person, there's an opportunity, right? Good. I guess back up. Does every priest think that everybody that comes in is confessing moral sins? I mean, I, unless someone tells you specifically, I don't think it's mortal. And they may not, so there may be some questions about the mortality of a sin, right? But I think it goes back to the same, same resolution. Well, did you know that was wrong? Yeah. Well, did you do it anyway? Yeah. Oh, all right, there you go. Right. The gravitas of the sin is really what, I guess, matters. And even, but even, even seemingly kind of, uh, we would say, venial sin, right? Maybe thoughts... And, 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 and words or thoughts and, and, uh, and feelings well you know the sinfulness of that really kind of depends on the person right I mean what I, I always like to make a distinction between a lot of times when it comes to thoughts and feelings we don't necessarily control what pops into our mind or the feelings we have those are kind of products of external stimulus right but we can't control what we do with them do we dwell on them do we harbor them do we act upon them right and that may be the mortal, where the mortality of the sin may lie. And it may not just be, you know, it could be something innocuous like, well, you know, I cut, a, cut someone off in traffic yesterday. Okay, well, did you know you were doing that? Were you doing it for a particular reason? Like, what was the purpose? Did they do something earlier? Like, was this reactionary? Or you just want to be a jerk, right? I mean, so there's... there's well, yeah. let's say I wanted to get to the exit. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the thing. I mean, so there's there's... There's also sins of omission or commission, right? Right. So maybe your initial intention was, oh, my, here comes my exit, I gotta get over, right? So the sin may not necessarily be in the intention that I wanna get over to that exit. The sin may be in the lack of prudence I made to not determine that that exit was coming up and make better choices in getting over there. Because ultimately, maybe getting over the exit would be the problem, but let's say you cut someone off and you didn't realize that someone honks at you, you then realize what you've done, right? And so maybe you can start to liberate in your in your in your um, you know formation of conscience, right? And say, oh yeah, I cut that person off, but I didn't mean to do it. But I was doing other things, and maybe I should have done something earlier to not do that. So the sin of omission in that respect, not necessarily the sin of commission. And as we grow in our spiritual lives and our moral lives, we really tend to come. Um, a wise a wise spiritual director once told me that as we get more mature in our spiritual life we tend to not focus so much on the sins of commission or realize the sins of omission that we actually do. Say that again. As we grow in our spiritual life, we tend not to, to kind of fall away from sins of commission, right? We don't necessarily, we don't necessarily get better in that respect and become more focused on the sins of omission. 
like things we may have should have done but didn't. That sounds like more things become sinful. Exactly. And if you look at, well, that's, <laughs> that's not fair. If, if you look, if you look at, and, you? Yeah. <laughs> and I see that, and that's, in, in a way, there, there's, there is a, like a level of, like, you know, they say ignorance is bliss. In a way, that's very true. Yeah. Mm. And as we grow in our spiritual lives and we understand morality better, we then understand that, oh man, I do a lot worse than I think I did. Because and you we, know it was wrong. Because you know it was wrong, but right? commission was that you already right. didn't know. Right. Yeah. And so now, in a way, it's sort of like, well, is it better to say ignorant? Yes. yes. Well, but also, <laughs> we're, 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 that's also below our dignity, though, too, right? Because we're called to, to use our intellect. Right? We're given this great gift of intellect to know these things, self-knowledge. And so really, to know these things actually is an act of grace. Hmm. Right? It's an act of love of God. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. So you choose not to. You choose to stay ignorant. So and that's yes. So that's the difference between willful and unwillful ignorance, right? So, oh. so people would ask, like, you know, so let's say an atheist. We, we, those are our kind of discussion about. This last week in, in RCA, we mm -hmm. had a discussion about uh, baptism by desire, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very, we have to be cognizant of the fact that baptism by desire also means there's an implicit desire to to do good. Which really is, is is sheds that grace of the sacrament upon somebody, but with that we have to understand: well, did this person know any better, or should they have? Right. So, in other words, if an atheist, we can say an atheist. Let's say you're uh, an atheist here in first world United States, might be different than maybe an, a pagan or an atheist that was grown up in some far flung tribe that didn't really have anyone go minister in the sacrament or bring Jesus to them. In one circumstance, you say, well, they, they had no chance of knowing who Jesus was. They had no opportunity whatsoever. And they're in, they're in, un, they're in uh, uh, invincible ignorance, we would call it, right? Invincible, meaning they didn't will it, they had no opportunity, and therefore God's grace will shed upon them as long as you do good. Compared to someone who may be living in invincible ignorance, meaning I probably should know better, but I don't want to. Um, maybe to kind of illustrate that, when I was in the seminary, we had, um, I think I've talked about him before, but Father Robert Spitzer came to talk to uh, the seminarians, and he did what, they have this uh, lecture, le a lecture series every year at the seminary in the beginning of October called the Kendrick Lecture Series, and they invite speakers to come in and talk about certain topics, uh, and he was talking about faith and, and reason, science and faith, right? Um, he has background in astrophysics. Physics, uh, so he's a really intelligent guy. He's a Jesuit, so you know he's one of the good <laughs> Jesuits, I would say. Um, but he wrote this book called *In the Beginning*, which was kind of a, uh, a a look at the scientific reason for Genesis, like how we look at the Big Bang and how really the Big Bang was actually confirmed back in like 2008. There was actually data uh, gathered to show that there was kind of this thing called the Big Bang that happened and caused all things to exist. Huh. He also looked at some things like what, what is the possibility of life even actually um, being on this planet? And the chance of life being on any planet whatsoever is one to the 10th to the 100th to the 123rd power. Now, if you were to take that one and put it, but write out all the zeros behind it, you couldn't get through it in a lifetime. Writing all those zeros. So impossible. <laughs> So again, nothing's impossible with God, <laughs> but highly improbable, right? So he was talking about these things, and, and I was had the opportunity with one of my brother seminaries at the time, now a priest, um, to take him to the airport. And we asked him this question because we both had a scientific background, my, myself and the seminary, the other seminary, and um, we've dealt with a lot of atheistic people in our in our. Careers and um, not, I, I would say most 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 believers than not I, in my experience I, I would say, but um, we had a few and we would and we asked him like you know so you're saying all this stuff has been kind of proven that the stuff we read in Genesis there actually is a scientific data to show this is all true. Well then why why would a scientific person then not accept it? And his answer was was really simply said well you you're a scientist yeah. You felt people like yeah. Well, then you should know that in order to actually, toward, so if they have to, if they believe it, that means they have to change their lives, hmm. right? 
That means if I, if I have to conclude that all this information is correct, this data is true, that everything that was written in the Bible is correct and true and been scientifically proven, that means that all the moral stuff that was brought in is also true, and I need to start following it. Hmm. And it was very simple, but also very striking. It was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, but that would be the difference between invincible and invincible ignorance, right? That a person of a scientific mind, well, here's the proof. And if you are a person of reason, you can't conclude anything but this is true. But then you can still choose not to. In which case, well, are you really ignorant anymore? Those, <clears throat> those tribes you were talking about, mm -hmm. aren't there religions that say that they can't get into heaven because they don't go in through Jesus Christ? Well, I can't speak for any particular domination. I can speak for the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is always taught there always is grace, and there's always entrance for those who at least implicitly want it, right? So um, maybe some do. I don't know. Yeah, I had a, a friend that just insisted that the people in Africa can't get into heaven, and it was like... Well, that's, now that's a different claim. I, that's, I, I, actually, I would say what's actually fascinating about Africa itself is that that's probably one of the growest, growingest Christian countries in, or Christian, Christian continents in the whole world. Um, there are probably more Christians now in Nigeria than the entire United States alone. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so I, I think it's, I wonder, I, 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 probably what they mean is yeah. that remote tribes, and pagan tribes in Africa who have no missionaries going to them uh, may not. Now, I, I, okay, let's put it this way. Um, you look at somebody like Socrates, right? Socrates was born 300 years before Jesus. Um, he was the father of Greek philosophy. Um, he posited that virtue is a good, and then his, also his students, Augustine and Plato, the same. Um, he even believed there was a monotheistic God. Because a God, a, a true God would be simple and unifying, right? which also led to eventually his death. But he posited in hell that there was a one God. Now, would you say then that he's in hell be just because he never had any interaction with Hebrew people or lived before Jesus came? I don't think I can hold that. Everybody. Before right. Jesus, right. then didn't make it. Unless you were in the people of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. well, I would find it hard to believe that there weren't Gentiles out there that maybe did very good things. And we see that today. There are atheists and, and pagans that do very good things today. Right. I would find it hard to believe that because of those good works they've done, there's not an implicit desire to receive grace. They may not know what all that means explicitly or have it in their mind what it means. But I think it's so open to them. Because there, there is a po there's some positive theology too that at the moment of death we are, we are presented in front of Jesus and we see Jesus for who he truly is. Whether you're pagan or atheist or whatever, I would hope and imagine that at that point you have the opportunity to receive him. We, we treat that as a church, that you're given that opportunity at the very last moment of your death. Well, it's just the last moments of your life here on earth. And so you can still choose. Now, you can also not choose. Um, Bishop Rice used to say that uh, he, would, uh, he would end every night with, um, with this word, Lord, I praise you, I adore you, and I love you. And then you hear a story about a mystic who witnessed uh, a man die. And Jesus came to this person immediately, the man, and offered the grace to him. And the man was so upset the fact that he died, he, he rejected Jesus and started cursing and he rejected it and he was condemned to hell. And so now Bishop Rice ends every night with, I, I praise you, I adore you, I love you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think we're all given that, that opportunity, regardless of our state of being when we're dead, to actually receive Jesus. Now, again, Contrition is all that's necessary. Just some contrition. 
That's it. God can work in that. And if, if now that doesn't mean we're going straight to heaven, possibly, but we're destined for it, at least. And that's why we train ourselves on earth today, to receive that grace when that time does come, right? Uh, we've been hearing in the liturgy the last two weeks all this discussion about end times, right? Getting ready for the end. Well, he's, Jesus is talking in two ways about the particular, the, the general judgment at the end of the time, but also our particular judgment. Where we're going to, our life, our time in this life is going to end before, hopefully before the world ends, and we're going to be judged. And what state of our soul, of our soul will be with that moment? Will we be ready to receive Jesus or not? Right? Will we actually be able to say yes to him, I believe and I love you? We hope so. I had a Jewish friend that we would discuss, and uh, she says, you know, that you know, Jewish people are still waiting for their Savior. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you, when he comes, you'll get introduced to him, and, and we'll say, oh, Jesus, nice to see you again. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's truth there, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, we're in the, in the end time, the very end of the world, we're told Jesus is going to come back to the same way he left. And at that moment, all peoples will see Jesus for who he truly is. But even then, there's a choice, right? There's still a choice. You can choose to believe that, and same, it's just, you know, same with the whole the whole issue with studying of the Big Bang. You know, scientists can choose to believe it or not. Whether they believe it or not doesn't actually affect the truthfulness of it. But they can also be used that can also be used against them if they don't. Good. Any other questions or comments? or thoughts. So then they, the ones that don't believe finally realize what a mistake they made and that's part of their torment? So you're saying like at the end of the world or currently? When they die. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the, the great tragedies <laughs> of, of, the, of that particular judgment is that you can choose not to. And we can we, we Again, we hope there's no one that, that would choose not God, but there may be some that did, that do. Um, and yeah, I think that's part of the torment is that you know you're 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 settled with that choice for all eternity. Why would they, why would anyone do that? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's why we hope there are no there's nobody in hell, right? We kind of hope there we hope there isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always say this, you know, I kind of hope Hitler's in heaven, because that means I got a pretty good shot. Right? <laughs> oh, gosh. But, I mean, but uh, that's the thing, but the grace, that salvation is also given to Hitler. But possibly because of the way he lived his life, because of what he chose to believe, what he chose not to believe, maybe he made that choice. Or doesn't think he deserves it. That may be too, right? I don't know. I can't, I can't speak for anyone's particular judgment, not even really my own, because I don't know what it's going to look like. All I can do is hope and trust and try to do the best I can to be in a state where I can receive him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's kind of a... Yeah, I, I can't imagine not making that choice. But then again, also, I've been raised a Catholic my entire life, and... I've accepted the truths of, of what the church teaches, what Jesus teaches us. But I guess there could be people out there that haven't. Right? And that does form us. That gives a foundation of what we believe and what we, what we, what we choose. I think I'll have a tattoo. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Just Jewish, in case you careful. can't say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just so in case I'm not thinking right at the end, you know. <laughs> at least I believed when I had the tattoo. Too. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think we all had examples and people in our lives who have chosen not to believe. I mean, it's sad. And we can do everything we can on this earth to try to convince them and try to, you know, move them closer to Jesus. And I think we do that best by being good examples of what a Christian is. But ultimately, it's their choice. You know? And I, I would think those that maybe have rejected the faith, the grace, the, the, 
the contrition, salvation is still open to them. The grace is still open to them. At the moment of their death, I think they're going to still be given that chance, an opportunity. And we would hope they would take it. Right? I mean, we go back to um, the prodigal son or even the, the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, right? I mean, some of the, some of the workers came at 6 p.m. They only worked an hour. All right. And they're, they're still saved. They're still given the opportunity. Right? And that corresponds to these moments of death where you're still given that chance. Um, I had a friend I worked with. <laughs> he's married to a good Catholic woman. Woman, he's married. He's, he's raised as a children Catholic. I think he was raised a Huguenot, which actually was a uh, a faith that, that emanated from France around the time of the Revolution. It was very anti-Catholic, anti-Church. Um, basically, it's, it was uh, atheistic, um, champion of reason, that kind of thing, right? And uh, he would talk to me about conversion and. He said, well, there's an, always a deathbed, right? <laughs> that's my conversion. I can always do that. I'm like, well, yeah, but you, if you know when that time's coming, I mean, that's great. But if you don't, uh, I might want to like, you know, get on it. Um, we joke around a little bit about that. But uh, no, I think, he, I think he's, he's going to should be okay. He does, I think he implicitly believes. But he hasn't really taken the steps of, you know, becoming baptized and doing other things, right? But I think it's the grace of... of the Lord will still be shut upon him, and he had the opportunity. And I can still work on him a little bit. Maybe me and his, his wife and I could probably work on him a little bit to get him to that point. But um, yeah, I think that's open to anyone. Right. It's a deathbed conversion. Yes, right. That's what that's what he's hoping for. <laughs> he's hoping for that last hour in the vineyard. I'm like, all right, well. Well, he's leaning that way. I mean, he, no, he, you're right. He is. No, I mean, that's the thing. He's. I I think he. Would you say he was really agnostic? You know? Or? I don't even know. I tell you, I don't even know if he's agnostic. I, 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 I imagine at this point he probably does believe. But I don't think he would really, you know, but this comes down to the whole thing about um, religion can be sometimes a burden for people. But even though it's not supposed to be. So you hear a lot, of, especially in this generation, it's more about I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious. And that really is nonsense. nonsense. Right? It is nonsense. It's you know, it's it's God gave us the church for a reason. He gave us ways to connect with Him in a deeper way. So the church is necessarily for. Uh, it's not really a set of rules, right? It's supposed to. It's really more to, to live in more freedom and, and more truth and more love of God. It's really connection. That's the purpose of of, of religion. To connect people with God, so they can actually live a fruitful good, healthy life. Then what about other cultures where, like Buddhism, where they don't go to the church? Yeah. Where they're not, it's not about Jesus and God, but there is a, a the higher power. Sure, and I think we look at that way as saying, well, there is somewhat of a good there. Yeah. And there's, in the same way, there's still implicit uh, grace being mm. desired. Mm. Just because they don't have a full understanding. Now, you could make the argument, we probably can do better. I don't, I don't deny that. I think we could do better in evangelization or bring people closer to Jesus. All of us can. None of us do it perfectly. Um, but if you're saying, if you're asking, can they still be saved? Well, of course they can. Of course they can. Um, but are, are you talking about if you're talking about state of life? Well, there's something to be said about living. There's a truth. There's a truth in Buddha, Buddhism um, that is good, right? Mm-hmm. But the problem, I think we would say as Catholics, there's not a fullness of understanding there. Hmm. There's not a fullness of, of truth. There's not a fullness of, of happiness and joy. There's still a lack in it. Where the truth of the Catholic Church gives a fullness. Hmm. That one can actually you know, live in harmony and unity. And, and again, imperfectly, but at least their standards and the ideals are there. Some people just don't want to admit that they were wrong. <laughs> yeah, we all struggle with that, don't we? I mean, I can say from a personal standpoint, when I was an engineer, <clears throat> that was hard to do. Because a lot of it comes down to credibility. You think that if you commit failure, that you lose credibility in people's eyes. In some ways, that may be true. But also, some of it may be just an, it's an act of pride, right? That I will have to be right, or else 
What does that mean? That My daughter is an engineer. So yeah, I've raised one of those. I I I understand. I understand. It's 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 a uh, it's a burden. Yes. You know? I have, a, I have a sister who's a nurse, and I think she kind of falls the same way that, you know, because nurses, I think, have a, in the medical field, have a particular uh, responsibility, not only with life, but also, like, you know, in the hierarchy of, like, you know, the medical field, um, they kind of have to fight for themselves sometimes, right? Well, reverse. Yeah. Nurses. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think there is kind of a, uh, a more of a temptation to not admit Failure. <laughs> in the same way with engineering yeah. field. I mean, the same way. I, mean, I think there's truth. I think there's truth there, right? I, don't, I think I can probably find that in any profession, really. Sure. Um, but also, we're told that failure is, is a good. It's an act of uh, of learning. And an act of humility. Humility is not a bad thing. That's different than humiliation. We have to be very careful about that, too. Right? Good. All right. So back to the omission and commission. Sure. <clears throat> How do you talk with somebody who says to you that they knew it was wrong and they did it anyway? All right. Well, I mean, you, what, what are you talking about? Like, just in like general or in the in the in the confessional? Both. Yeah. So, typically my counsel is always the same. If it's something that's, um, it really depends on how chronic it may be, so. Because they're not supposed to confess it if it's something they don't intend to stop. Well, I guess that's different than doing something wrong. Even if well, see, that's, that's the thing. I mean, when it comes to confession of sins, um, yeah, you're, you can really, I mean, yeah, the intention to stop is kind of a, a difficult thing. You can still have the intention to stop and still like, fall into the same problem over and over again. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So in other words, like um, someone who, who commits, like, let's say, cussing. You know, I cuss all the time, and I do it in front of the kids, and it's bad, and I know it's bad, and I do it. Okay. Um, is this a chronic thing? Yeah, I just keep on doing it. I, I, I don't want to, but I keep on doing it. Which, for, for our sin, the sins that keep on coming, that's usually the case, right? I don't want to do this anymore, but I do it anyway. I keep on doing it. I don't know why. So my counsel to them is usually, well, okay, let's come up with some strategies to maybe recognize these situations for what they truly are and try to avoid it. When we think about our African tradition, we try to avoid the near occasion of sin. Okay, well, to do that, we have to understand the circumstances we find ourselves to lead that sin. Okay, so I usually curse when I'm driving, all right? That can be, that can be difficult, right? Because you can't stop driving. You can't really stop driving. <laughs> um, but you can recognize, okay, someone just cut me off. Maybe I can train myself better to say, maybe I can just say a quick prayer from Holy Spirit at that moment. Mm. Or maybe what I can do is, you know, maybe I get a swear jar, right? And I give that money to charity at the end of the month, right? Or what I find helpful is uh, more of a positive, positivistic approach where I'm going to set a goal for myself. I'm going to maybe go a day. Maybe, maybe it's just half a day. Maybe it's an hour. And I'm not going to say a bad word. And if I, if I, if I, succeed in that, I'm going to treat myself as something good, holy, healthy. Maybe I'll go see a movie. Maybe I'll, you know, have a meal with friends or something like that, right? And then we set another goal for maybe like two hours or two days. or And we keep on expanding that goal, and eventually those old bad habits are replaced with better new ones. So typically that's my counsel, depending on how chronic it may be. Now some people may be, well, maybe you need to see someone talk to someone about it. Maybe you have to get a spiritual director actually find the root of why this is happening right and help you dig it out or maybe a therapist do you have those conversations i was talking about the sorry i didn't grow up catholic so this may be a stupid question for you but um my hairdresser her sister is a nun and we always talk about uh you know catholicism and mm -hmm. she goes to daily mass and confesses once a week goes to confession once a week and she makes a running list all week as she's going along of everything. She, but this is the nun or the hairdresser. This is the hairdresser. Oh, okay. sister's wow. the nun. Okay, okay gotcha. Right? Right. Wow. And uh, <laughs> and she makes a list all week, and then she goes in once a week, mm -hmm. and she reads. Really, but she she doesn't get into. She doesn't elaborate really on. It. She doesn't have a conversation. 
it's it's more of like a list of um Laundry remember the list. sheet we got it at Laundry list. Yeah, yeah 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 so she just said and she she said because yeah, i know what it was that i did and i'm talking to jesus through the priest so i don't have to explain it yeah sure uh well but this, see part of the sacrament though is receive counsel now i don't know what the priests now some priests may say in general maybe maybe look at more prayer or deeper prayer life whatever but Typically speaking, the, the sacrament also includes counsel over oh. these things, right? So you do talk. Oh, sure. Sure. I thought it was just me, because I'm pretty sure Monsignor walks the other way when he sees me. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, not very good. No, I try to give at least some I, counsel. I don't want to talk. Yeah, I, I just, just try to give some one. counsel to the confessional of how to overcome certain sins. And so sometimes, especially if it's like maybe a plethora of things, right? It's maybe just better to focus on one at that mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And so, like, you know, if someone comes in and gives, like, a laundry list of things, I might just say, well, out of everything you just confess in good confession, what would you say you struggle with the most? Right? Let's concentrate on that. Because usually you find the one that you're, you're struggling with the most, the other ones kind of flow from that in a way. Mm-hmm. Right? So it might be, like, you know, um, yeah, I have a struggle with uh, purity and... Um, uh, Temperance and you know, I go out and I and sobriety Okay, which one do you think you struggle with the most? Well, probably sobriety Nine times out of ten is that's mm-hmm. what's leading the other things mm-hmm. And so the, the issue there may be well, you know, it's not bad to go out and actually have a drink every now and again Moderation is key and sometimes a lot of these things it probably comes down to accountability So when you're going out who you're going out with well friends and they keep drinking they buy me drinks I'm like well then Maybe you take a different friend Maybe you can take someone that can say after maybe two or three or however maybe if you're to- know you your tolerance and, and know you well, say man that's enough for tonight. Hmm. So you do talk about you talk in the confessional. Oh, I, I, I do. Maybe that's maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I'm too long. I don't know. But I find it helpful because you know part of the job of the priest is to give that counsel hmm. as Jesus. What's well, a spiritual director? Yeah, so uh, a spiritual director is uh, someone, I think we've talked about this before, maybe, I don't know, but if, if so, sorry. But um, I think it's always good to bring it back up. Um, there's someone to help you like discern, to find, find the root of some of the moral issues you may be struggling with. Um, typically, they're a confidant, um, someone to help you through some of the spiritual issues and, and maybe your prayer life. So they're trained, or it's just somebody who's very active and wants to do, or active so, in the church? So, technically speaking, uh, a spiritual director is a clergy. Uh-huh. So, in order to be a spiritual director, according to canon law, one needs to be ordained. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that you can't be a spiritual guide, right? So, other, a lot of lay people can be spiritual guide, provide spiritual guidance, and do kind of the same function, but the difference would be, like, you could go to confession to your spiritual director, as long as they're a priest or bishop, right? So a spiritual director could be your confessor, too. Confession is more about absolution, forgiving of the sins. Spiritual direction is really towards the root of the sin. Do any of you have a spiritual director? I do. No. You do? Oh, uh, yes. All priests should have one. I don't think I knew there was such a thing as a spiritual director until maybe the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, heard about it. Yep. So were there spiritual directors all along, and I just didn't know it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was supposed so. Okay. <laughs> Is it maybe one of those things, you know how, like, life coaches are becoming more trendy now? Mm-hmm. Like, maybe it's more trendy to have one? Yeah, where, where do you think they got it? <laughs> okay. yeah, it's funny, you, you see trends usually in secular society, kind of, where did that come from? It's like, would you ever check the Catholic Church? Typically, they get this stuff from the Catholic Church. That's just, yeah. Typically, that's how it goes. Because it works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But no, as, as I think anyone who's struggling with either with moral life or even discernment, too, like, um, that's one of the jobs of spiritual directors help you discern where the Lord may be leading you. But also, I mean, also develop your spiritual life and your prayer life. That's the main focus. So it's different than, like, therapy. Now, some of that does come in, but... Primarily, the spiritual director's job is not to, like, you know, provide you with um, psychological or emotional help. It's really more about your spiritual life. Now, your spiritual director could have resources, though, to help you with some of those things that affect your spiritual life. Because our natural lives do affect our spiritual and vice versa. Um, but the main 
thrust of the spiritual director is to help that spiritual life, help direct it towards uh, towards its proper end. How do you find one? Mm -hmm. I would start with your parish priests. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of the religious orders are have them. Um, it's getting harder and harder now. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was in the seminary, someone approached me, a layperson approached me about getting one, and I started calling around different orders, and it seemed like none of them were available. Um, and so I had to direct them to well, start with your parish priest and probably go from there. Um, I know I have about, at any given time, about nine directees. Really? Mm -hmm. So is it, um, is it like gender based or it doesn't matter? I guess it's just a comfort level. Yeah, so, so it's all for comfort of the directee. So um, if you prefer a woman, fine. Now, that's not technically speaking a spiritual director because they're not ordained. Oh, right, right, but right. But they can definitely fulfill the same role. Oh, right? yeah, they have to be ordained. Yeah. So, so I, I was told directees when they first, first meet, I said, look, this is, a, this is like a relationship. Um, uh, it may work out, it may not. I'm going to leave that up to your discernment. You know, it's always it's always good about maintaining boundaries too. So I always tell my directees, I don't contact you. If you want to set up an appointment or something, you contact me. Yeah. First off, second, if you feel this isn't working, I have an obligation to help you find someone new. And they're going to hurt my feelings if it's not. You know, because a lot of this is a lot about compatibility. It's really about getting to know each other in an intimate way. And finally, the last thing I tell a directee is. Um, Typically, if you feel that you don't want to talk about something, that should be the first thing we talk about. Hmm. Right? So, uh, those are kind of my three introductory roles, so to speak, when meeting with directees. Would it be easier with a parish priest or a Jesuit? See, again, that comes out. So, again, the other thing would be like uh, part, part of the process of the spiritual direction would be like determine what your school of spirituality may be. Right? Mm. So, maybe, maybe you are more of a, a you know, a, like nation oil and like his you know, spiritual exercises. Okay, great. So maybe Jesuit might be better for you. Maybe you're more about the little way, which kind of like call them Carmelite. Maybe better have a Carmelite, right? Um, maybe you have a great zeal for the poor or zeal for like, you know, uh, spreading the word of God. Well, maybe Franciscan's up, up your alley, right? So part of that process is figuring out okay, what, what best speaks to you spiritually. What kind of school of, of, of spirituality really speaks to you? Um, and then can we develop that? So just because you have maybe a Franciscan or Jesuit spiritual doesn't mean you have to have a Franciscan or Jesuit leading you. But you should have one, should have one knowledgeable about those schools to help you develop that. Right. So when you say you have maybe nine directees, mm -hmm. does that mean that they come and go? They can. And yeah, so some people say maybe they want to come every month. Right. Some people say only maybe as needed. Whatever. Did you say nine or nineteen? What, what, what did you say nine or nineteen that you nine. Had? Oh okay. Nine. Oh nine, yeah, yeah, nine. I thought at first yeah. you said nineteen. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get about probably about my max. I don't know if I can yeah, take any more. That's a lot. Depending on how much they come. Well and part of that is I always try to leave some open for so my my approach, and I'm not sure if this is good or not, but my approach is really to be more lenient, lean towards parishioners than not. So I have some that are not, and I have some that are, um, but I try to leave that open more for parishioners. So let's say if I get to about 10, but then a parishioner may come to me and say, hey, you know, I really could use this. I might turn one of my non parishioner directors and say, you know what, I think we have to find someone else for you. Especially if they were only coming to you ad hoc and it's not Yeah, really I mean, it kind of depends, right? Yeah. So I, I, I tend to try and find someone that will suit them and go from there. I've, had to do, I've actually had to do that a couple times so already. Interesting. Yeah. So there's no particular rules as to how often or anything you're on I, I try to meet with my spiritual director like once, about once a month. Just because it's good for me, and also it's just good to maintain that relationship. Yeah. And plus, my spirit, I love my spiritual director. He's, he's, he's very good. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also a question about when you're choosing someone. <clears throat> I think Teresa Valley used to say, um, 
She would rather have a spiritual director that's knowledgeable than wise. Um, and because, you know, just because someone has an experience in the spiritual life doesn't necessarily mean that can translate to someone else. And so she would rather, she really wouldn't care how old the spiritual director is or how young the spiritual director was, as long as they were knowledgeable about the spiritual life. That could really help her. I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, she's a saint and a doctor of the church, I think we'd probably take that into consideration. Um, so oh, yeah. I would tend to agree with that. But I know personally, I prefer a more mature spiritual director. Um, part of that's because, I guess, I don't know, um, as I, coming, in, coming into my vocation a little bit older, there's something about someone that they have an experience that can really help. But that's just a personal thing. I, I, I think it'd probably better have both. Someone who's actually knowledgeable and experienced. So maybe I would, I would, I would, I would reply to Teresa Bell a little bit with that, maybe. Um, but it's also a matter of personal preference and feeling. You know? That makes sense. I always tell my son, like, it does not matter. I know you think you're smart at 12, but it does not matter how smart you are. Like, I've been on Earth 40 more years than you. You've just seen, it's that experience to me speaks a lot to yeah, me. Like, you've sure. seen more, you've felt more, you've well, met more people. Like, you're yeah, it's, just going to be, I'm smarter than you, sorry. Well, I think a lot of kids think, like, their experiences are unique, and it's like, we've all been through puberty, we've all had experiences with yeah. school, all of those things. Now, I will say that there is maybe uniqueness in, in kids today just because, they have a lot of stuff that we never had. When we oh. I mean, social media and computer. I mean, it's awful. Yeah, it's hard I mean, to so obviously, like, I, I really feel for kids growing up in society today because it was hard enough with probably our experience, and now you add all this other stuff to it. And the diversity boy, boy. Yeah. angle of it. Yeah. So I mean, I, uh, <clears throat> I know I can't say that I know for sure what what children these days are going through, but I think we definitely have those common experience, shared experience of puberty and these. Things in school and bullying, all that kind of stuff too. And if he's twelve, it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm hoping it's a phase. Uh -uh. <laughs> Thanks, Robbie. Sorry. You know, I, I always found. Um, don't make me. <laughs> I had this theory. This might be true. I don't know, but um, just my limited experience of child rearing, as small as it was, uh, I I found that raising girls for the first about. 11, 12 years was rather, was a lot easier than raising boys in the first 11, 12 years. But then the next 11, 12 mm -hmm. years, it flips. Yes. Um, and that, there may be some truth there. I don't know. There may be some scientific studies on that. I'm going to look at that. But I found that to be the case. Hmm. So I've the, heard that. The easy part's coming up. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> After the teenage years. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns, heresies? All of that is really points to ponder. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah. New stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to get much older if I'm going to keep finding new sins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny because like, you know, we celebrated uh, a few weeks ago like these great women saints who were, uh, some were lay people, some were lay people and religious, and some were fully religious. And what's amazing is a lot of these these women and well the men but women especially, they tend to be daily um, confess like penitents. They would go to confession every day, and you'd be like, "What could you possibly have done in a twenty four hour period?" As, a, as we're sitting here, <laughs> what do you say? So what you, Kids. Well, well, maybe yeah, maybe. But usually it's in the religious order. So what they were like, especially the religious orders, they would go like every day. Wow. And there's things like you've been praying all day for the last 24. hours. Like, what have you done? What have you done? Um, and I think there's some truth. Okay, like, <laughs> well, yeah, maybe it's more, but probably more sins of omission, right? I mean, well, like my 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 sister, she dropped her books and she couldn't help her again. And you know, in some ways, I will say, hearing confessions of religious orders is so convicting. Because you hear these things, you're just like, oh, good Lord, I didn't even, I mean, I'm not doing that. And what are you talking about? I mean, um, I've, I, you know, it, it's, it's been said, and it's very true in my experience, that um, hearing confessions of especially um, cloistered nuns is like being stabbed to death with a feather. <laughs> it really is. Because it's just like, 
okay. You've got to be kidding. That's sinful, you know. I know. Well, that's the thing. It's like, okay, well, if you're, if, you're, that. if that's sin for you, then we're all screwed. You know, kind yeah. of thing, right? Um, it, it's beautiful, though, but also, like, because th they take the time to go through every moment. And they can tend to be a little longer. But again, it goes that whole spiritual, you know, spiritual uh, maturity thing, right? That we, as we grow, we're, we're more aware of these yeah. things. And so that really means they're very holy people. But where does that go off to being scrupulous? <laughs> yeah, I think there's, well, I think, so I've heard scrupulous confessions. I've heard uh, confessions from, um, you know, cloistered nuns. And I think the difference is, like, for... For people that are scrupulous, there is a almost obsessive compulsive yeah. approach to it. So in other words, a scrupulous person, they can tell you the exact number of times they've committed each and every one of those sins. And perhaps even give you the dates, hmm. right? And uh, it is, it is a, uh, almost a psychological uh, issue, right? And so we're, we're trained that when it comes to someone with scrupulosity, um, we don't do anything in general. We're very specific with our counsel. We're very specific even with our penances. And so typically for someone who's like um, scrupulous, um, my counsel is very pointed, very direct. And maybe I may even say, well, you know what? Um, don't come back to the confessional for three days, right? And that, that can be a struggle. for That can be a, that can be a real struggle for people with scrupulosity. And my, my penance may even be, um, just say three Hail Marys, that's it. Just say them, that's it. Don't say them for any particular intention. Because what in a circular person's mind, they would say, oh shoot, was I thinking about that the entire time I was saying that Hail Mary? And they get this almost kind of uh, catch-22 where they keep on going back and forth mm -hmm. and saying Hail Marys over and over again. And maybe they get so they get so wrapped around the axle about it, did they actually do it or not? Well, I'm glad I'm lax. Mm. <laughs> it's like, was that Hail Mary meaningful enough? <laughs> I mean, or, you know, did I, did I, how many did I say, oh no, okay, I start over again. It's almost like an OCD involved with it, hmm. right? But even someone who hasn't been diagnosed with it, they can still suffer from it. But I mean, that's not to say laxity is the, is the solution <laughs> to that, right? I mean, <laughs> Obviously, we want to be we want to make sure that we do confess everything that's on our our, our mind as far as you know, um, kind and number. And number doesn't have to be like fifty times to be a few. It could be you know maybe a couple. That's that's really what we actually get out. So we can actually make sure that our conscience is clear, because otherwise we'd be lying to ourselves, and that's also sinful too, right? So yeah, there's there's a mid idea between those two places right now. Right. I just hadn't heard those words for such a long time. Well, through velocity. Through velocity and, and yeah. lax. Yeah. There we have, yeah. I, 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 would, I would possibly say, so we said our first confessions. Um, this is the season of first, first confessions. And that's always a question when it comes to people with first confession, right? Because I think the kids often ask, like, what do I do? What do I say? And it's like, just say whatever you feel is you're guilty of, right? Just say, I mean, because... Here's the thing, even if you don't remember it, you're still forgiven. But you're supposed to say everything, right? You are. My son's convinced he doesn't have to say everything as long as he knows it. Uh, no, yes. And I was like, so, no, I'm pretty sure so that's not the, it. The matter of the sacrament is contrition, and contrition is shown through the actual verbal saying of them. You're supposed to so, say Yeah, it. so anything you withhold is not forgiven. Uh, so we have to be very careful about that. Yeah. Now, ignorance. <laughs> that could apply here. Oh. If, 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 if they, you didn't really know that, okay. But, but now you do. Now you do know, so <laughs> you should probably do that from here on out. Right. Yeah. And fortunately, we talk about that. We talk about confession. The sacrament. No, actually, we're talking about confession and morality. Oh, good. So that'll be, I'm uh, sure, I'm sure will come up. Um, but yeah, no, it, you should be saying anything that you're aware of. Mm -hmm. Number and kind. And... There is, there, I also want to say this too, there is also a level of detail that's not necessary. 
<laughs> as long as the confessor has a general idea of what you're talking about. Now, the confessor may ask certain questions and kind of have a better understanding. Like, uh, let's say uh, you come to the confessional and you say, um, I've had uh, bad thoughts. Okay, that doesn't necessarily give me the kind. Are you talking about like, malicious thoughts? Are you talking about impure thoughts? Are you talking... So I might ask, like, can you tell me what you mean by that? Just to get a better understanding. And all I need is like, oh yeah, uh, uh, malicious thoughts. Okay, that's it. I don't need to hear about, I really thought about killing my husband over and over again. and went, oh, I, I, Okay, I don't really need to know that. Okay, how many times do you have, maybe how many times do you have malicious thoughts? Well, a few. Okay, good, great. That's all I need to know. What you tend to get sometimes is certain people, especially the scrupulous people, uh, may go into certain detail. Now, in some ways that can be helpful for them because they're actually getting it all off their chest. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it can just be, it's just detrimental. But you can't say, I don't need that much information, right? You have to let them say what they want to well, say? Well, so it depends. Like, my tax in the confessional is, this is if this is help, helpful for you, okay. Because sometimes I have a pen and ask, like, how much do you need to know? I said, as much as you need to give me to feel um, forgiven, mm. right? So I will say, all I really need to know is number and kind, but especially stuff that may be more embarrassing, you don't have to go in great detail about that. As long as I understand what you're talking about, that's all I really need to know. What's the average time people are in confession? I mean, I'm sure it varies, but. Well, see, okay, so that's a good, yeah, you're right, because this is like, so if we have the 730 confessions here, or the 4 o'clock confessions at the Herod St. Gabriel, I said the average about seven. Now, certain people may take... Seven minutes? Seven minutes. Okay. Certain people may take maybe double that. Um, the bell curve. If you go to Acts Confessions, okay. those maybe last about 10, maybe 15. That's a different environment. Yeah, and I think part of that's too because, like, I think so, like, so let's, like, when I go on retreats, um, typically, especially in the seminary, oftentimes we have a, we have a spiritual director there for that retreat, and sometimes it can take longer because, well, you know you're never going to see this person again, probably, mm. and so maybe I can unload a little bit more than I would maybe with my usual confessor. I would think, too, with the retreatants, they're so overwhelmed I mean, with right. all the information and right. activities. Right, exactly, much more aware. The brain is yes. rolling. Right, so you're kind of more aware of, of things you've done. It's like, oh, man, I don't know if I ever confessed that, right? Hmm. So maybe you bring that up. Seven minutes. Same with acts retreats, I think, too, right? If you act retreats, you come, wow, you know, some of the talks may stir. Oh, wow, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah, what's going on, acts retreat? And my husband had just recently died. And I went in there. And I just, you know, I had the book that you're supposed to. I just threw the book. Yeah. And I said, you know, and then I said what I wanted to. And he goes, I'm not going to forgive you until you talk to your doctor. Mm. And I had just gone into such a deep depression. And he says, you call me when you get an appointment. And I think he really wanted to push me into getting some chemical help. And uh, so I did. I called the doctor and, and mm, well, signed up. And I was like, because, <sighs> you know, I was just, I lost it. And, uh, you know, I wanted to just walk out in traffic. I just wanted to die. I want, and he says, you know, I can't. You know, you call me when you get an appointment. And I was like... Well, I don't want you... So here's the thing. I don't want you to violate anything in confessional, nor would I ask you to do that. But I... I, <laughs> um, I don't know if that... Again, God's grace works in any ways, even outside of the sacrament. But I don't, I don't know if I would have done that. Because, um, let's put it this way. People often ask, like, let's let's say a mass murderer comes into your confessional, right? And they come and they confess what they did, and um, they say, you know, I, I I may do it again. Not I will do it again. I may do it again, right? Or let's say they suffer from a psychological issue and they even say I will do it again, right? A lot of that has to be determined. I would not withhold absolution from them. Now my counsel may be. 
why don't you come talk to me outside of, of the sacrament? Or why don't you go, I really think you need to talk to the doctor. Here, here's even some numbers you can call and talk to people, right? But I, 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 without knowing all the details, I don't want to. Um, there has to be a very specific reason of lack of contrition to hold, hold absolution for anybody in the sacrament. So I'm not saying what the priest did was wrong, because I don't know the circumstances, but there would have to be a very, very good reason not to withhold absolution. Because if that bus hit you after you walked out of there, then you, right? But I was but it just worked. mentally not yeah. responsible. Yeah. And, and with, you, with me, that would be even more reason to say I looked off you. Right? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, again, I don't know the circumstances. Just make you feel any better. Yeah. Well, it made me make the phone call. Yeah. yeah. That's good. And I just called him up. Just wanted to let you know I got a phone call. Yeah, I mean, so it's funny because you hear story, like uh, the bishop, uh, Archbishop Carlson, used to say like, you know, he was in a professional and he was talking to this person, and the person was kind of leaning towards he wasn't sorry for a particular thing, and he said, "Well, you're sorry. Are you sorry? You're not sorry." And the person said, "Well, yeah, but don't say anymore. <laughs> stop. Right there. Yeah, just stop there, okay. and we'll go. Yeah, because because that's all that's necessary for absolution is contrition. That's it." Um, and unless, unless someone would say, like, I, I, I did this and I'm not sorry for it, okay, um, can we find some contrition here somewhere, right? Well, you're sorry you're not sorry. Well, no, okay. Well, obviously something pinged your heart here, so why, why are you even saying this? Mm -hmm. And so part of that's opening them up to understand, are you really, maybe you are really sorry, in which case I can't absolve, I can't absolve you. But that would be the only reason you wouldn't absolve someone if there's no contrition. But wouldn't God have absolved you? If God can work outside it? the sacraments. He certainly can. And we also have confession by desire. But even then, contrition would still be necessary. So we went back to talk about someone who was hit by a bus, right? Mm -hmm. Contrition. It's all about the contrition. And not just sorry for certain things you've done, but everything, right? So you can say, like, in the moment of your death, you say, yeah, I'm really sorry I blew up that church. I'm not so sorry about, you know, maybe killing the priest. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's, not a, that's, not, that's not a perfect contrition, right? You know, and that goes back to the shame, right? That's like, oh, well, that's a mark of shame for all eternity then for you. Especially if you're baptized. So... I, we're, we're kind of taught that you always want to be generous and merciful with your absolution, right? Um, you can be a little more just in your counsel and your penance, but you're always generous, generous and merciful with the absolution, as Jesus would be too. Hmm. And that's why I always, yeah. that's why I hear these things, it kind of pings my heart a little bit. It feels like, oh man. And that's probably why, if it weren't you, and maybe that's an act of the Holy Spirit too, right? If there was somebody else that came into that confession and he said the same thing to that person, mm. boy, that would be not only wrong spiritually, but also you may have just lost someone from the church, too. And that wouldn't be the penitent's fault. That'd be the priest's fault. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But I think he thought it was the, the right yeah, call. Yeah, and again... I, Right, circumstances are there. I don't know, and I don't want you to say anything about what no, happened. I have no um, so, <laughs> we'll just we'll trust the Holy Spirit was working there because obviously He was, right? Yeah. Good. And it worked out. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. I try not to cheat my brother priest because that wouldn't be right. I just can say what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you get. To do. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Good. Like, like nurses. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I wouldn't have done it that way. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, like, in the engineering world, you know, we always say there's more, more than one who's going to cat, right? And it's funny because, like, sometimes we get these what we call revisions coming up in the, in the, in the uh, engineering world, and it's like, well, someone else worked on it. It's like, well, I don't know if I would do it that way, but you can talk to that person. <laughs> I, I mean, he knows better than I do what's going on, or she knows better than I do what's going on, so talk to them. Yeah, I don't know. As a leader, it was a little more difficult because you had uh, 
sometimes you had to make those those calls. And I always tried to support the engineer because you always want to show a unified front, right? Um, but there's been a couple times just like, oof. After running the numbers, you find out, oh man, this was not the best, right? Best thing to do. Well, she was in, my daughter was in a position where she could do something about some of these decisions mm -hmm. that were made. And um, she took care of it. Yeah. <laughs> You make enemies there too. Uh, yeah. I, that, I keep on telling people like I'm happy being an associate for as long as possible. Because <laughs> I know that once you start making decisions, you start making people angry at you. And right now, I don't have to do that. So, perfect. She just wanted to do what was safe. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the oh, years. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Your time is sharp. coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I mean, Associate forever. I, I actually, our bishop that's possibly said no. I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> so he didn't give me a time frame though either. We'll see. Permanent associate. Yeah. <laughs> well, they used to have um, uh, what they call them um, IRRs. Um, Irregulars. No, irremovable <laughs> rectors, meaning. Um, if you let's say you had a, a priest that maybe established a parish, oh, and as long as they were there, maybe they were for like 20 years, they can get the it used to be in the old canon law code. You could have this um, after your name be like uh, Reverend So and So IRR, and what that meant is the bishop could not move you without your permission. Yeah. Now, that, obviously, that's a problem. <laughs> and so, when the new code came out in 1983, they removed that <laughs> for five different reasons. I mean, how did they get that code? I mean, the, how did they get it? Yeah. I mean, it could just be uh, that you, just, you established, maybe you established the parish, and you like maybe you held all the build you built all the buildings or did something new, or if you were just there for a long time, mm -hmm. you could you could petition your bishop and say, "Can I get the the title of IRR?" Mm -hmm. Now, what, where that causes problems when you have a new bishop, right? And so maybe for the first bishop was cool with it, but the next bishop comes like, yeah. well. I'm bound, I can't do anything now because you have that title. And so you'd hope the bishop would take that consideration, but I don't know if they did. I don't know if they did. That was before my time, so who knows. Can the parishioners petition to the bishop? To they can. Somebody? They can, but I don't know how what good it would do typically. I mean, it could, oh. it could maybe influence them one way or the other. But, but the same way, it's like, well, if I need that, let's say... It's really more about using the goods and uh, of, of the actual pastor. So let's say I have a parish that's struggling, and this person would be perfect for that parish. Well, if you have IR, I can't move you. So that par whole parish struggles. They may even die. That's why I never want to be a bishop. That's a, that's a position that I would never want. Make those determinations is not good. I you know. Uh, so let's pray I never get asked, okay? Please, you keep that in your prayer. <laughs> All right, well, very good. There's no other questions. Or do you have questions? Online, we have at least one person watching, but no comments. So um, if anything else, it's uh, 7.38 now. It's been over an hour, so. Does this time frame work pretty well for everyone then? 6.30, is that working out? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, you know, we got a couple reactions, and um, we were in the sacristy the other day for uh, the church short, and uh, uh, one of our, our good parishioners is also on the liturgy committee. He mentioned that, uh, why not just make it 6.30? I was like, oh, okay, well, Brilliant. I guess we do that. Because yeah. some people were like, well, 6 is too early, right. and then so on, and so on, it's too late. Yeah. And he was like, why not 6.30? We were like, like, oh, like, oh. Yeah, that works okay. out. Okay. That's brilliant. So, um, if there is any conflict or this uh, problem, that will let me know. But uh, we sh next week is another Bother the Father, so it's the last Tuesday of the month. And the seventh will be Friends Food and Faith. And that moves back to 715. So this only applies for these Tuesdays. Um, the first Tuesday has to stay at 715 just because I may have adoration and benediction. 7 or 715? 715 because we try to do it after benediction adoration for second Tuesday. So that's the... First two Tuesdays are seven fifteen, and the second two Tuesdays are six. No, the first, so the first Tuesday every month is seven fifteen. Okay. Every other Tuesday is six thirty. Oh, gotcha. Um, and it's just because, like I said, we have adoration on the first Tuesday, so I may have to do benediction, and so I wouldn't be able to get over here until seven fifteen. Yeah. 
Now, next also, week is Women at the Well at 7. Well, you have to skip that. Um, <laughs> or you can come here for half an hour and then go there. And then go there, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the Women at the Well have been kind of messing with me a little bit. It's like, wait, yeah. you know, so what's going on? I was a little surprised that they scheduled it. Yeah. And overlap. Can you find why they don't like me? What's that what happened there? What's going on? Why don't they like me? Well, isn't it Sherry that schedules those? I don't know. Is it? I'll ask Tuesday night. All I know is the first time I ever went, I got here. <laughs> I went to the, I went over to the cafeteria because I saw the Pat Volta and went, well, I was like, okay. So I went in there and they kicked me out. Yep. Oh. I said, Father, you can't be here. I'm like, oh. Okay. Really? You're not, a, you're not a woman at the well. Like, all right, yeah, you're not a enough. woman at the well. So I've never tried to go back. Now they're trying to take my time here. Whatever, whatever, it's fine. You know, I'm a suffering servant. What can I say? It's the Holy Spirit. He's that's right. That's right. He's up to something. I'm gonna ask though because you know I'm sure there's other people that would like to come here but also go there. Yeah. It's not a big deal. It's all right. Well, it's interesting that because there was a lady that was not from the parish but was interested in the topic and came to I think two meetings 